It's Sunday, June 30, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to discuss the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is one of America's foremost thinkers in crisis management. She's the faculty chair of the Homeland Security and Global Health Projects at Harvard and Kennedy School of Government. She also served as President Barack Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the DHS. She is the author of the book, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Professor Juliette Kayem, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thank you for having me. So we, we have lots to discuss. I want to first reflect on a, on a comedian that I saw on Instagram who said that um, he said Trump did great for jobs because he brought uh, domestic terrorism back to the US, and whereas before we had to import our terrorists from other countries. Yeah. Now we get them here in, in the United States and they're white, which was, I, you know, he obviously delivered it slightly better than I did. <laughs> But, but, but the irony is that there is a kind of, as I believe, an elephant in the room, and that is yeah. that off the back of January 6th and off the back of the rise of fascism and the rise of Trumpism, that, that domestic terrorism is a, a genuine threat that the yeah. authorities are taking very seriously. Yeah, don't take my word for it, take the FBI's. I mean, it, it's, right. it's um, so I want to do all the caveats that are necessary, right? So the foreign terrorism threat exists. And it's probably higher than it was a year ago because of the war in Israel and uh, between Israel and Hamas, because you just don't, you know, people get energized and radicalized, but it's not, um, it's not organized. It's not, uh, you know, Al Qaeda type event, but you, one does worry about that. And we certainly see it, um, uh, you know, in, on the web, in the radicalization. I think it's more likely, well, two things. One is I just, cause, to get this out of the way, Hamas is more is 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 um, winning the war of propaganda in terms of sympathy for the Palestinians and concern for how Israel's waged the war, um, and therefore attacks in Europe or in the United States don't make a lot of sense for them in terms of of that strategy. Uh, um, so that's one piece that still exists, and it's higher, but it's not like. The red lights are flashing, but we certainly see and hear our intelligence agencies and the FBI be concerned about it. The second is, and I got, you know, got to say it because it's there, but also so that people, um, uh, know that I know the numbers. There is some percentage of left wing, uh, violence, um, uh, in particular and, and violence. I would describe our terrorism as for a political cause. It tends to be in the environmental sector, but look, we, you know, we've seen it. We've, we've, um, uh, uh, addressed it. It's been condemned. And it's probably somewhere between, if the FBI is looking at domestic terrorism, probably somewhere between, you know, 12 to 13% of the cases that they're pursuing would be left wing. So what does that leave? Right. So that leaves, um, a tremendous shift in the terror threat we're seeing in the United States from international to domestic, and then the the unquestionable uh, 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 weighting of right wing terrorism outnumbering left wing terrorism, and why is that? Now, this is obvious. It has been nurtured by a political party, um, and you can call it all ki kinds of names. I don't, you know, if you feel uncomfortable calling it terrorism, you know, then then don't. But there's a there is a a uh, political strategy uh, by which violence or the threat of violence um, is a natural extension of democratic differences. And that is a part of the election strategy of Donald Trump. And it's not condemned by, by the party. Um, and it's not, you know, it, it, it's barely addressed. They sort of get around that question. So that's why you're seeing it is, is essentially a nurturing, a nurturing of violence political strategy. The, the cost, I guess, of hate speech and anti-government rhetoric for more than eight years now, you know, and, and yeah. this is what the, the legacy of Trumpism really yeah. has brought us. Because prior to Trump, even if you didn't like the Republican candidates or, or lawmakers, they still weren't lawless at least publicly. 
Yeah. And and what has changed, I guess, yeah. is the fact that, you know, Trump and and we know this from Steve Bannon, you know, that the idea yeah. of trashing institutions and, and causing chaos and, and bringing down these kind of pillars that, that, that maintain democracy. Yeah. So so it's like the rule book went out of the window. The only problem is the other team, the Democrats, are still playing by the rule book. Yeah, it is. Is, I mean, is this going to work out? I think, I mean, there's, there's one is. I mean, a, cu- a couple of dynamics coming out of 2016. Um, and I, I, I write, I write for the Atlantic. I've written, I think I've written about two dozen essays now on, on sort of Trump and violence. So what we have, cause it's not consistent. So what Trump inherited, and it's worth people knowing, and I say this descriptively, not, not, um, critically. In 2016, three simultaneous things, three things happened or three things coalesced. The first is, and, and, and this, the first is relevant because that's the, in the, in the atmospherics of the right wing, um, you know, mag extremism is, um, 2016, the year Donald Trump gets elected president is also the first year that the census, the U.S. census documents that non-white U.S. born babies. So we're not even talking about immigration now outnumber white babies. That means that 2042. We will be a majority non-white nation. Now, people define themselves differently, but, you know, Hispanic, what is that? But, but nonetheless, at least by census tracking. So that's part of their atmospherics. They view the pie as limited. And now their piece of it is, is being taken, being taken away. This is the replacement theory. They, the, they the actually believe theory, it. Right. Yeah. Which so we hear about on the, Fox News all the yeah, time. It's, and it's they a talk Sean about Hannity it that favor. way that the you know, it, it can't possibly be possible that the pie would expand for everyone, right? No, it's, it's got to be. And think about what that means. I mean, I always say this about replacement theory. Think about what that means to a listener, right? It, it, it literally means something you own is being taken from you. So they, they, they can couch violence in terms of self-defense. This is what Trump does. He, he views it as it was mine, stop the steal. That was a steal. That was his. Yeah. And then violence becomes not the aggressive violence. It becomes self-defense. And that's how they justify it. The, the second thing is, of course, social media and the, the, I don't use the term lone wolf anymore. There's no lone wolves. This is a, a nation in which these guys are nurturing each other. We saw this with the January 6th cases, how, how January 6th became so big. There's a nurturing aspect for it. And then the third is, of course, the, the, the leadership. And I'll just point to Donald Trump. Um, um, uh, and it's changed over time, um, uh, nurtures, flirts, promotes, directs violence. Um, and I, I use those different words because, um, in the early years, uh, to show you how much has changed, in the early years of the Trump administration, um, he was very coy about it. And there's a wonky term called stochastic terrorism for those who care that we were using to, to say, well, he's, he's, he, you know, he says things like, you know, free Michigan, right? And so he knows what his listeners are going to hear. They're going to hear, I, I got I to gotta kidnap the governor, right? Um, uh, by, by 2020, like December, um, those of us who write in this space, we're saying we're, we're done with stochastic. Like, there's no more, stochastic meaning that he just, you know, can have plausible deni- deniability that he, he wasn't directing it. He was just sort of promoting it. Um, and that, that it was directing. And now it's hard to say, um, that he's doing anything but directing violence. We can talk about whether it's being effective, but that's definitely the strategy. And it's a, it's a new factor in our democratic processes that's being felt by public officials and judges and jurors and everyone else. The, the FBI director, Christopher Wray, he, he condemned the January 6th riot yeah. and, and he called it domestic terrorism. And he defended the Bureau's handling of intelligence indicating the prospect for violence. And he, he told lawmakers that the information was properly shared with other law enforcement agencies, even though it was raw and unverified. We now know, obviously, the story about the National Guard not being, yeah. you know, purposely being sidelined so that in the end, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer had to get on the phone from the bunker. I mean, the, the whole thing was so very clearly organized and we had Proud Boys and yeah. 
stand back and stand by. And now we've had people being prosecuted for seditious conspiracy. So, you know, much of that now has, has been dealt with. But there is still the elephant in the room, Juliet, and that is that the man that said, we're going to go to the capital, and if yeah. you don't fight, you're not going to have a country anymore, and I'm going to go with you, has still not been held to account yeah. and, and has for only that. recently right. for, and, that, for that. For that, and, right. And we don't right. know, you know whether he ever will be. This is going to be you know, an issue that, that the court will address if, if it hasn't already. Um, and so you know, what, what does that mean? You know, will he ever? Um, and I, um, um, how do I want to say this? There's a lot of ways to wage a counterterrorism campaign. This is, I, I should go back as January thir- 11th or 12th. I wrote January of, of 2021. I wrote a piece in the Atlantic, got really criticized, but because I think people couldn't get their head around it, right? Which was, we have to treat this like a counterterrorism campaign. You can call him whatever. And that is you, you isolate the leader, you deplatform him, which was being done at the time. And he's essentially somewhat deplatformed in, in many ways. You, you, you go after the soldiers, you break up the groups, you, you condemn and shame and all the things that, that, um, are necessary. And you saw that for a little bit. You saw, you saw some of it for all, all this period of time. You know, look, there's moments I look back on if McConnell had stuck to his guns, I think the last four years would have been different, right? If he had just stayed with that narrative, they're so freaking afraid of him and, and this. Or even ratified the impeachment, Julia. Yeah. I mean, I mean and this, and this that base, might have helped too. Yeah. And this base that they're so worried about, but the base has nowhere else to go. So why are, you know, like, you know, this could have been rewritten. The lack of agency they're asserting over their own party is pathetic, but it's not my job to save them. Um, it's our job to try to save democracy. So, so, I mean, you're exactly right that, and so, so another way to think about it, or one wants to hope for hope, right? Is, is that the Trump in an orange suit in a jail is only one scenario that, that can work you know, that, that, that is victory. And I, 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 I'm a, a national security analyst for CNN and I love my lawyer analyst, but their confidence in some, you know, fell swoop by the law is just. Yeah. The, the judicial it, process. But, yeah. They've yeah. been saying it for four years. This is the one. This is, there's no one. Yeah. Right. It's just a, it's, it's, you know, it is a, it is a, a de-radicalization isolation by a million cuts. Um, and, and it, will there be a single blow? I don't know. I mean, it could be in November, um, of, of 2024. If he wins, um, I'm, I'm certainly of the school with my other Atlantic writers that it is, it is hard to see, um, uh, uh, how the systems can withhold that. So I do view this election as, um, as absolutely critical. Uh, to not just not just democracy, but 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 a, a nation that um, you know is not controlled by the mob, because I think I think I think those people will be unleashed, right? Because they will they will view themselves as as being forgiven. But I agree with you. I mean, it is it's is shameful. We're at this stage. It shows we had a much more brittle democracy than any of us could have imagined. Uh, but there is some kick in it still, right? I mean, we do see these arrests. Uh, the groups have not reformed. Donald Trump, despite all of his support by uh, uh, in the party, um, really can't fill a room of his people. Um, he has not been able to organize mobs or crowds around his his um, his court cases, um, and nor around the the verdict. So, you know, you know, all of this will be decided in November. But you know, this is this is a this is. Um, you know, one side goes forward, the next side goes forward. This is, I don't want to say civil war. It's not that. It is just a, 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 a consistent, um, attempt to, to, to denigrate what he has. And I, and I'll just want to end with this. I, I think promoting violence still is hard for people to approve of, right? We see some polling, whatever. And I think reporters are getting smarter. I've seen it just more recently. I, I kept writing, can we stop asking whether they'll accept the election? They're not going to accept the election if Biden wins. We know that. Just stop asking. That's an easy question. They're not going to accept it. There's going to be no concession. And 
you know, if, if Donald Trump loses, you know, guess what? He's running again in 2028. Trust, trust me. Um, but if he, if he loses, um, or before that, we have to get very focused on this issue of violence rather than, than MAGA, right? There's a, there's a difference. And I think if we can begin to focus on that and ask questions like, if Biden wins, will you, Senator who pretends like you're a rational human being, you know, will you condemn violence um, or uh, 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 by by Trump supporters? Start to get them on record. It doesn't violence doesn't poll well. But so, how do you get Republican senators to break with their supreme leader? Because yeah. you know this is the problem, isn't it? That they they are so in the cult or he has compromat or he yeah. will ridicule them or they will lose their jobs because of how he will publicly humiliate them. So that's the reason why they're sticking by him Yeah, because they want to be in the, you know, in, they want to back a winner. And at yeah. the moment they're kind of working on the assumption that he's a winner, despite the fact that he hasn't yeah. won anything I, since 2016. Yeah. And I think that, so look, this is what it is. So as a, as a Democrat, right. It is, it is not our job. I always say this to my Democrat to pay attention to these people. Honestly, they are not going to change. Like it drives, I, I'm on social media like you, like how many times do I have to hear the same people? But like, can you believe that Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz? It's like, I kind of can because they've been doing it for eight years or however long they've been doing it for. So like, you know, the surprise factor, the outrage factor isn't working, right? The what is going to work is he has to lose and he has to lose so strongly and i'm i'm of the simon rosenberg school i mean i'm i'm yeah. like that, which is which is basically that that trump as we're seeing yet again in june um underperforms uh the poll yeah I, I have i have the same i have the same view as simon and i and i feel like the um, the media has been lazy to actually join the dots and yeah, realize yeah. that he is only popular because he tells you. He yeah. Is. Yeah. No, it's, 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 uh, you know, they take his numbers at the, at the, at, at his rallies. Those numbers are absurd. I mean, I do, I do, uh, crisis management. I know how to count numbers. There's not 25,000 people, but count people. But I think that's exactly right. I think there's a, a couple things that give me hope. I mean, one is his underperformance Two is like, you can, the, 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 the energy, Whatever people, whatever the media wants to say about Biden, the energy is on the Democrat side. It's not on the Republican side. And I think as a, as a mother and a mother of a daughter, none of this polling, although there's a new story this week about the, the post row vote, none of this polling is picking up, um, the Dobbs factor. And it's, it's decisive. It's just decisive. So we, you know, I know it's like not a solution, but like, Spend all that energy on why are we, why is Ted Cruz the way he is? Guess what? Not going to change him. If Trump loses, right, um, uh, um, he will, um, uh, there'll be a lot of people uh, rewriting history and their own history. I, I lived in South Africa. I'm not making the comparison. I'm just saying you can't find a single person today living who uh, who supported apartheid, right? I mean, a losing strategy, people will abandon. And this is this is the truth. This is this is what I mean by a counterterrorism campaign. Terrorist organizations win. You could call them what as again. You could call him, you could call Trump whatever you want. They only win by the narrative. I mean, they, they only succeed by the narrative of the win. The narrative of the win gets them bodies and money. So Trump is a multi, as you said, multi loser across the board in courts and in, in elections. Um, and, uh, and it is very hard to sustain a narrative of the win against all those losses. This is like, you know, this, this is Nazism didn't go away. It lost, right? ISIS didn't go away. It lost. Like they still exist, right? Those horrible ideologies, but that's not our goal. Our goal, as I said, our goal is not hearts and minds. It's the ballot. And, and we have to just focus on that. Uh, changing people's minds right now, um, uh, is well, changing the minds of independence is important, but changing the minds of the, of the diehards 
Why? Why? But but there is a certain sadness with the fact that the people that are in his camp, and I include the fiscal conservatives, the, the you know who are just in it for the tax yeah. for tax purposes, yeah. that they are happy to see the country crash and burn, yeah. and the system of governance crash and burn, just to achieve their tax break. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Like there, there, there doesn't seem to be any patriotism no. that that kind of gets in the way before before they go. No, just give me the tax break. Yeah. I mean that that's what's so sad about this because all i've and as an outsider you know all i ever heard about was how patriotic everybody was yeah. and how the country and the celebrating freedom and, and and democracy and yet here we are at this precipice and everyone's like nah just give me the tax break i don't care if the whole yeah. country collapses and i think i think but part of it is then then is is why the counter strategy has to be very much focused on you know you know not that Trump is discovered, that, that basic, I mean, one is, of course, as I said, violence. Violence continues to be the through line and to yes. make that, and to make that, and to make that absolutely clear. The Democrats then, or the media, depending, um, it is very, uh, they're not seen, people who say stuff like that are not seen, um, we're not narrating well the, the end of democracy narrative or just not. And we have to figure out a better way to do it. I think I'm more confident that it will become clear because I think Trump is not, um, I'm not a doctor, but I, look, I, I, he is the leader of a movement. I study him. Um, the more that he is out in public, the harder it is going to be for people to ignore it. I know we'd like to focus on Biden's walk. Um, but, um, you know, how does he go down a staircase? Uh, but, you know, I'm of the George Conway school. I'm of, of the, of the, you know, which is, um, um, you know, or Tom Nichols at the, at the Atlantic, which is, you just can't ignore this anymore. This is not a like crazy New Yorker being New Yorkery. This is, you know, you, you hear him speak and, um, and it's, it's not right. Like it's just not, Sentences. And it's, it's just it's just unfortunate that the, the 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 Democrat candidate is old and is is not aging particularly well. Yeah. Despite the fact that you know he has all his his yeah. marbles, the way I describe it is that Trump is the dictator and Biden is the delegator. Yeah. And I think if you understand That's a great that Biden way, right. has the most diverse, youngest cabinet in in history. And that he does delegate, yeah. whereas Trump won't have anybody do anything. Right. It all stops with him. And so That's I exactly think we need right. to probably make more of that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and I think, I mean, I don't think Trump's going to show up for the debate. So just be Biden sure. alone. I mean, I think it's going to be, so there'll be opportunities for him. And he, you know, Biden has had some pretty awesome moments lately. I thought the D-Day speech was terrific. What cracked me up about the D-Day speech is he never mentioned Trump. And then yes. all of the commentators and, uh, you know, uh, uh, right wing commentators and, and Trump people were like, that was so disrespectful to go, go to Normandy and to make it a political campaign. I was like, I, actually, I think, you know, <laughs> you're like, he never mentioned Trump. Why do you think it's Trump? Like, you know, it's like, call them on it. Like, of course, you know, that's exactly what, what Trump is like. Um, but it's, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I laugh about it. It's not, it's not funny. These are very horrible people. Um, and the lack of backbone, I mean, it still surprises me. I think a couple of years ago, I just decided, yeah, I was wrong about human nature. It's, it's more, it's, it's, it's I, I want to talk more about that yeah. because I think this notion of actually seeing people, you know, when it comes to immigrants at the yeah. southern border and referring to them as illegals or as vermin, even. Yeah, or invaders, invaders is the is the new yeah. word to give that sense of that's a, yes. that's also a violent right They're ta Invaders are taking our homeland. Right. That's the same language. OK, well, let's take a quick break and we'll come back and, and do that right here on The Weekend Show. Ten seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base. How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling T-shirts and Midas Touch merch. 
and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back on The Weekend Show with Juliet Kayam. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, Donald Trump, as described by the... Department of Justice. I, I was actually reading up on on because I knew we were going to be talking, and I thought oh, I would read up on like violent extremism and how yeah. it is defined by the DOJ, and and they define homegrown violent extremists are those who encourage, endorse, condone, justify, or support the commission of a violent criminal act to achieve political, ideological, religious, social, or economic goals by a citizen or long term resident of a Western country who has rejected Western culture, cultural values, beliefs, and norms. And then I started to kind of think, well, that's basically Donald Trump's campaign promises. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we look at Project 2025, this Heritage Foundation document, all 900 pages of it, and get into the weeds of what the plan is. And it's not like they're hiding it, Julia. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, there's a PDF, for goodness sake. Oh, God. So, 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 you know, for the media to have dropped the ball so much, on this, I'm talking about the three major networks, the yeah. news that people might watch, a and it's now left to kind of independent journalists and, and and organizations like this to have to kind of fill in the gaps. But we're effectively we talked about a dictator versus a delegator. You know, Donald Trump is represents all of those horrific and horrendous things that, by all accounts, would make it entirely illegal for him to get a job as a teacher yeah. or as anything else, and yet. For some reason, that does not apply to the president yeah. of the United States. I mean, I, I mean, as I said, you know, I just think what has been surprising, and that's why I sort of criticize the lawyers with their confidence in the law, yeah. is how much of our democratic norms were custom rather than, you know, if you're the president, you just don't do this. Right. So so you know, if you're the president, you don't lead an insurrection. So not surprising that the statute might not be clear on that because, you know, custom would have it that the president would not lead an insurrection. Right. right? Um, uh, and, and so I think and that's why um, the, you know, the, the confidence in the courts. Right. This like. Yes, it's a big deal. He's been he you know been found guilty of a, a not a non January non insurrection related crime, but you know the you know does anyone think the Supreme Court is going to you know solve this for Donald Trump? I mean, or solve this for Biden or for us in the next three months? I don't see that. I mean, of course not. And so that's I mean, I I the, the definition is clear the, of, of, of counter of violent extremism. Um, the actions in my mind are clear of what Donald Trump is doing um, and, and welcomes because that, that fear and anger and violence becomes both a motivating force for his people, but also is terrifying for, you know, school, you know, school committee members or, or whatever else you sort of, you know, terrify the opposition. And, um, uh, uh, but, you know, a lot of, 
when I say like a lot of our norms were because we had been so good at it for so many years, right? Yeah. They were cost, custom. And so I just, I don't look to the law as sort of, this is going to solve it. I look to the equivalent of a counterterrorism effort, right? That it is, it is, it is, you know, why do terror groups um, recede? They don't die. Ideologies don't die. MAGA is not going away. As I said, he will, if he loses, he's likely, if he's alive, he's likely to run again in 2028. Um, but you can isolate them. And that's where Republicans, you know, failed us miserably. They could have, they could have done this. But every move is seen as a political one rather than yeah. one for the good of the country. Yeah, no, and and I, because everything is now weaponized, that, you know, even Joe Biden has had to kind of watch his son be criminalized yeah. for being a drug addict, yeah. for uh, crimes that would never normally be criminalized. No. But because it's the president's son, they he has to go through this process. He already lost his other son. He may lose this son to prison. Yeah. And and it, and it's in you know at the age of eighty one. I mean, it, it's it's so very sad that it's shameful. I do think I mean, it that, is a lawless that piece, nation. I, I I mean, I haven't seen the polling on it and stuff. And you know, obviously, the Republicans are moving the goalposts, and you know, somehow Donald Trump is innocent, and 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 Biden and uh, Hunter Biden did worse. Like it's it, none of it makes sense. But um, I sort of wonder both given how Biden has behaved and that hug, but also Hunter statements. I, I sort of wonder, you know, how, um, how that will be perceived long-term. It's just, it's just vicious, right? I mean, everyone knows that he was a drug addict. He admits he was a drug addict. He's, you know, the, the whole family was in some weird soap opera, you know, I mean, yeah. of, um, and, and he's yet, clean now. That's the yeah, other he's thing. Clean now, now that he's I mean, that clean. was his statement. That's what I loved about his statement is that, you yeah. know, you've been through this process is that he knows that he just has to do one day at a time and one day at a time. Um, you know, look, if Biden wins, I will be first in line to say, uh, commute his sentence. And if he loses, I will be first in line to say, commute his sentence. This is, this to me is the, the mercy. You know, why do we give presidents that authority? Part of it is mercy, that you show mercy on your son seems very legitimate to me. Um, Meanwhile, the, the his, list of people that Trump pardoned is, yeah, is pretty horrific. Yeah, I mean, horrific. his son didn't kill anyone. I mean, it's, look at, yeah. look at um, uh, um, uh, Abbott in Texas. He, he yeah. literally commuted the sentence. Did he pardon or commute the sentence? I can't remember. Of someone who killed Black Lives Matter. Yes. Uh, uh, activists. So yes. um, I, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, hardcore on that. I mean, I accept the verdict. And then I also believe there's processes to, 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 to show mercy. And this is just one of them, but look, this is not, you know, I don't, um, I don't know, maybe it's cause I'm in crisis management. I just like, I sort of am off social media a little bit now. Cause I just, I find it like, we just got to take all that anger and all of that outrage and because 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 the the because there won't be a decisive blow there's going to be lots of blows but i do think 20 i think if if trump loses two things will happen one is this thing does look different this country looks different if he's off the political stage it just does the because uh, someone will emerge in the republican party i don't know who it is but someone will um denying any you know this there, there's going to be a, a wing that will then realize we are losing too much the other is, um, I do, you know, and I've written about this, the peer, if, if Trump loses in terms of violence, the narrative Trump needs is that something was taken from him. And I do worry about the violence. It will be different than January 6th because Trump's not president, but whatever he will unleash between now, between November 5th and, and January 20th. Let's talk to what you were describing that you see in social media and elsewhere, yeah. this, this, this kind of, I call it a, a loss of humanity and civility, yeah. where we, we fail to really see people. So, so you know, the new victim are, are trans people. They're yeah. really taking the, the, the bulk of the hate speech at the moment, where, whereby they're almost, it's not that they're just being denied the opportunity to play in sport, which is obviously a, an open debate, yeah. but they're actually being denied the right to exist. Yeah. And, and, you know, historically, we've seen this through, through time, through the civil rights movement and everything else, how there's always a new victim 
for the right and the far right to to focus their anger towards. And when it comes to immigration, this is obviously a, a yeah. real kind of hot button issue because it is one of the top you know, economy and immigration, I guess, is where a lot of people yeah. uh, are making their vote decision. But the, the, the use of language, the failure to see the plight of people seeking asylum, it's got so bad that even Joe Biden has had to yeah. employ some of the Donald Trump tactics at the border in order not to solve the crisis, because I don't believe there is a crisis. I think that's a manufactured term. Yeah but just to appeal to people who might be thinking of voting for Trump because of his hardline position yeah. on immigration. Yeah. No, it is. I mean, it, the, the, I, I teach crisis management and I'm, I'm like you. I mean, you know, you, you know it's, it's like terrorism. You've got to use the word carefully. And, and you know, the way I, I write and think about and teach about it is, right, look, if, uh, um, you know, the crisis framework cannot solve the failures of public policy. Um, you know, it, so there's, is it a housing crisis? No, we just haven't solved, you know, the, is it the public policy issue. So the way to think about a crisis is, right, is, or the way it's described in the literature is, it's a, you know, disruption to the core capabilities of a nation or institution where your ability to respond is limited in time. That's just the difference. So, 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 you know, climate change is not, in my mind, climate change is not a crisis, the hurricane is, right? In other words, you know, and, and, and if we, and because this, the problem of climate change is going to be solved by public policy. It's not going to be solved by a bunch of first responders and as we, or, or, or the military as, as Donald Trump would often do. So, so that's a way I sort of think about it. So on the immigration front, I agree that the, you, you know, the numbers ebb and flow, right? And what we, ha but maybe we disagree on this, but one of the things we have to admit is that 20 years ago, uh, about, I forget the exact, don't hold me to this, but within, within the last two decades, the majority of people who crossed the border did so illegally. So our problem, and I've been in this a long time, our problem was, um, was interior, um, uh, uh, um, enforcement, uh, cause they were in, right? They're not, they're not presenting themselves anywhere. And so it would be for a, a gazillion reasons, um, uh, including, and I blame the Republicans, a narrative that our borders were open, right? If you say our borders are open, people are going to believe it, right? If you are the leader of the, the majority of the, of the Senate, and you're a Republican, you say the borders are open. Every, you know, every person who wants to come here goes fantastic. Did you just hear what McConnell just said? Um, and, um, and so that put a lot of pressure on the border and that pressure though changed. And this is, I'm not, I'm, I'm very torn about this from daughter of immigrants, but, but, um, you know, the narrative of why, why Biden would have looked at this particular issue as compared to, to others is what happened was then um, was that th those numbers change and that the vast majority of people who come over the border now present themselves as asylum seekers. So so and 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 then if you say, well, the, if they present themselves, then the law should allow it is um, belied by by what we know happened, which is it's just being used. And you could say everyone should get a hearing, which is generally true if they make it over it's the hearings three years from now because of our capacity. So that's their argument. The numbers um, in terms of people presenting themselves for asylum um, support their argument that this piece of it has needs to be tightened up. I don't love it either, but it's just it's a, and that what you then do is a combination of uh, then you move to a lawful immigration, uh, um, an immigration system that uh, ups our numbers of lawful immigration on steroids because we can sustain it. We have no unemployment. I talk to governors all the time because I do crisis management. You know, they're like, you know what we want about this immigration influx? We want work visas, Republican and Democratic governors. Yeah. Because yeah. I, 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 no one is picking up the trash. No one is doing X, Y, and Z. No one will take these jobs, right? This would be a win-win for everyone. So I think there's ways that we can, we can, um, 
take some of the pressure off the asylum system, which is, which can't sustain itself. And then what, what happens is you do lose people who le- not lose people who legitimately deserve asylum are obviously being harmed by this change. And then you, you up the lawful, but that's a, that's, but, but a the- public, that's a public policy problem. That's not a crisis. Like we know, we know exactly what we need to do. And it's just, people are, people are, well, because people because people are racist. Yeah, so, so I mean, it, is, yeah. it, it all boils and, down to racism. At yeah. the end of the day, it's like yeah. that they're they're, and, they're illegals, and, well, and but but well, the interesting welcome. thing is, my illegals are okay. I mean, that's the amazing yeah. thing, right? Is that you know you go to the south, and it's you know, or you go to a red state. It's like, well, those pe- you know those people are different, right? Because they're working for you. It's it's just a, I mean, it's a hypocrisy. But I will also say, like. And this is just, you know, as a, as a, um, security Democrat, one of the challenges or one of the challenges, I guess I would say the, on, on, for the more progressive side of the party from, I, as I say, I used to, I, I, I thought I was progressive till I met my kids, right? You know, I, I thought I was, you know, like, you know, there, but is, is what are the limiting principles, right? I mean, in other words, if people throw, you know, Biden's for open borders or the parties for open borders. Can we come up with a few limiting principles to that, right? Rather than, you know, we are a country that ex- accepts asylum seekers. Yes, we are. But it, but it isn't true, though, is it? No, this no, is no. The thing. I know it, that. It, 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 it isn't true, and, and so it's the it's the rhetoric that has been weaponized. Yes, and but and what I find, to, but we, I'm saying, I know it's such. We have yeah. to come up with what's our limiting principle that's more than. Trump is bad. What is the Democrats limiting principle to the, ch- to the charge of open borders? I mean, I know what it is, but I've been in, I've been in Homeland Security, right? You, you, you know, you, you have a greater border enforcement. No one likes talking about that. You, you open up lawful, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, immigration. And as anyone who's in the space knows, most undocumented, um, uh, uh, immigrants here in this country came in lawfully. So your real issue is not asylum, nor is it cro- unlawful border crossing. Your real issue is people come in lawfully and they decide to say, because we're a great country. Um, are they a problem? Probably not. Do we want, well, to- they want, they want to assimilate. And I speak yeah. as an immigrant myself, yeah. you know, it's like, I, I recognize the fact that anybody who is going to make that journey and, and drag their kids yeah. or carry their kids they're not coming to break the law. They're no. not rapists. They're not drug dealers. They're not from mental asylums. They're people who are seeking a better life and they want to assimilate and they want to really respect the United States. And if they were to get citizenship, it would be the greatest thing that they could possibly yeah. imagine. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and not enough is, is made of that. Yeah. Not enough is made of the fact that we are a nation of immigrants. Right. Not enough is made of the fact of, our, of, of celebrating our differences rather than just trying to s- segregate people. But finally, I would say that the investment, from what I understand, should be in immigration courts. It's, because it's, the problem is not the, the border patrol or no, the wall, they get building a wall. They get it's everything the they want. Right. No, it's the right. system of legalization. That's, a, that's yeah. what we have to focus on is that no one wants undocumented. No one wants because. If you're, I mean, honestly, you know, with the 13 million that are here, find a path for lawfulness because unlawful, we get harmed because you don't have a tax system, whatever. The system gets stressed because these are people that are taken advantage of because they don't have lawful sta- status. Um, and, um, it's not good for a country to have over 10 million people who are, who are, um, undocumented. I'm with you. I mean, we, we gotta, this country can sustain you know, X, you know, three yeah. X, four it's, it's X, whatever vast. it is. You could build it, whole new cities. Fine, right, right. Yeah. We're, we're told we can do this, yeah. but we have to figure out a way in which we're doing it within a system uh, that is like any country would, would regulate it. And, and that means for DACA, that means for uh, the, the 14 million that are, that are undocumented. And I think you're exactly right that it's the, it's not the, the enforcement, you know, customs and border protection gets everything they want. That's what that's, And of that's, course that's, Donald Trump vetoed the recent bill. We shouldn't forget to yeah, mention that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right. That's true. But that's because it had because it had 
a pathway for legalization. Yes. And he, he didn't want Biden to score any wins right. between now and the election. So, I mean, and, and that really is the reality of this whole situation is that it's political theater. Yeah. And, you know, that's why they're obsessed. Republicans are obsessed with Biden going to the southern border. Yeah. They're like, well, we went and here's our photo with the wall. Yeah. Where's Biden? And he's not here. Where's Kamala Harris? She's not here. And and it, it's so childish and it's so petty. It's almost to the point now where Biden's like, I'm not going and playing that yeah. game. But unfortunately, the media run with it and it becomes a story when, in fact, the focus should be on the on the humanity of, of this yeah. situation. Yeah. And that every country has, you know, especially, you know, countries that have multiple land borders, they have problems with with immigration. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it is. It's not it's like we're not that unique. Um, I mean, we're unique in the sense like we're we're actually in because of our uniqueness, we're better off because yes, we can I, I, we can absorb lots and lots of influxes. I mean, yeah. it's just I mean, this, this is the problem that England is having. I mean, the conservative government there is talking about sending people to Rwanda. Oh, my God. Um, I was in it's, England. It's the darkest rhetoric. It is. I, I literally was like watching BBC just like this is an aside and. And I'm watching music and they're explaining this plan coming out of the government. I'm like, like you, you literally cannot yeah. believe it. You're like, what? What was that? Yeah. So let, let's talk about how people are taking matters into their own hands yeah. regarding this, because there is a very large proportion of Americans who have this kind of libertarian thinking. They live in isolated areas, which invariably are food deserts, so they're not getting nutrition no one's really looking out for them you know the, the local police force is many miles away yeah. and ambulances so and, we, and that's the issue with the land mass isn't it you know yes we can absorb immigrants by nature of our scale but really people do live in very isolated yeah. ways you know outside of the coasts i mean there are interesting stories about people hearing this rhetoric about immigration and wanting to do something about it, the the hateful language yeah. that Donald Trump uses. We had that guy, do you remember in uh, 2022, the guy who tried to breach the FBI office yeah. uh, in Cincinnati, who was killed by police after he fled the scene of, and, you know, in a rural part of uh, the state. And, you know, I do think that, the, just going back to homegrown terrorism, the rhetoric on immigration yeah just plays into the fears of people who incidentally, when asked, how does immigration affect you? Oh, it doesn't affect me, no, fact, but I've heard yeah, that it's exactly. a real problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, it is. Um, so this is the, the rhetoric change in um, how Trump and therefore the Republican Party have spoken about it. They, they do talk in the invasion language now. So they've shifted yes. their way. So it's not illegal and document. It's, you know, there's, the verb isn't you know, came here or whatever it used to be. It is um, invaders, invasion. And so think about this in the context of self-defense. Because remember, they have to yeah. justify, get ready, you can't just like go out and kill someone, right? You need to, well, Trump thinks he can, but, you, but you, you've got to justify it in a narrative of something being taken away, whether it's your majority status in the United States or it's an election. So this is the same way that the invaders, right? They're taking your house, your wife, your daughter, your, and it's that language of taking, um, when in fact, we know all the data, all the data is consistent. That immigrants contribute, even unlawful immigrants contribute more than they take once they are able to, uh, uh, to get into a process of legalization. So, I mean, it is, it does benefit all of us. And two, their crime rates are lower. Right. They are, they're, yeah. significantly lower it's just like like by magnitudes like it's just a it's a population uh uh that as you said come, wants to work hard and they want their kids to possibly go to college and they want you know want to do all the all uh they want to be better citizens than 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 most of their critics there was a study by the nij uh, about domestic terrorism and they said that the study has now led to a better understanding of the process that result in violent action. And they say militant, nationalistic, white supremacist, violent extremism has, ex has increased in the US. In fact, the number of far right attacks continues to outpace all other yeah, types of terrorism others. and domestic violent extremism. I mean, 
and and this is why it's so backward the the because it's almost like it's projection yeah the, the, the people yeah. that are, are committing the crimes are the ones complaining about other people yeah. committing the yeah. crimes who aren't committing the crimes right it's no i mean that's i mean that's the um uh um you know that is the, the how, this is what trump has been so successful at doing yes. is in terms of you know I'll, I'll let me be more specific so do you remember a couple of weeks ago you know, all of these stories last a day. So, right. So the story where, um, when the secret service or the FBI, went, FBI went to Mar-a-Lago to get the classified papers, they had a indictment or something, you know, whatever, however the documents work, but basically that, that use of force would be allowable, right? Which is like a um, boilerplate language. Um, and they actually, it was boilerplate, uh, plate language so much so that it was used, uh, in, uh, in Delaware. For a sitting president, right? Like, I mean, and, uh, some crazy woman sort of discovers this language, doesn't know anything about love, puts it up. And then by within 24 hours, the, uh, the RNC or the Trump campaign, I don't know if it's the RNC was pushing out, you know, this conspiracy theory about murder, about, uh, you know, this project. And I, all I could keep thinking was, yeah, of course he's saying that because he, he's the one who thinks he can go out on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone, right? So he, he can project the same value system onto the sitting president when everyone knows this, you know, this, this idea of an assassination, but that was like a two, you know, that was, you know, 48 hours in the right wing madness. Yeah. And then but this is extremism, yeah. this, this use of language, yeah. this hate speech. I mean, all this stuff would be illegal in the country that I was born in. Yeah. It's all, it's all illegal. Yeah. And, and it makes me feel that the U S is, is actually a, a lawless, uncivil nation. Yeah. that just relies on lawsuits and people suing each other to maintain any kind of sense of civility. Right. Okay. So, but let's, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that something has been unleashed. I, I heard someone describe it as, you know, and it's true. Like lots of us were documenting 2020. I don't think any of us, January 6th, 2021, I don't think any of us predicted the, that this was uh, uh, a seismic shift, that this idea of violence and the threat of violence would be a campaign strategy for, or or, or a, a, a sort of, you know, ideological strategy, not by all Republicans, not by all Trump supporters, but um, you can't, you know, you can't dis, you can't separate Trump into good economic policy Trump and bad on democracy Trump, right? This is what the CEOs are trying to do. It's like, it's one yeah. Trump, you know, yeah. it's, it's. Well, there was no good economic policy yeah. because the, the national debt. Oh, the CEOs, by, are, so, by the CEOs are so pathetic. I mean, you know, yeah. just, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's shameful. And if you're a woman, I mean, you know, I, I sort of wish that women who worked for those CEOs would quit, right? Is it like you, 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 if yeah. you think this is okay for you, it's not okay for 50% of your workforce, right? Yeah. Um, uh, well, that, that's a, that's another conversation because of the inequality yeah. in in and the patriarchy. I mean, it's all baked yeah. into th this. We have to take another quick break, but I, I want to come back and, and finish this conversation. Okay, and, great. And actually talk about the the police, many of whom are on the side of yes. of Donald Trump. Yeah. Okay, that's next on the weekend show. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive, and it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work and family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. It's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and affordable alternative to those expensive whitening procedures. I myself had a whitening procedure in the dentist's chair several years ago. It was kind of painful, I didn't really enjoy it, and it didn't seem to last. Well, 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Simply add Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into teeth's grooves and crannies to get better whitening. 
Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time and no more messy strips or trays or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile you deserve. Visit smileactives.com slash weekend today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery, plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash weekend. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. We're back with Juliet Kayem on The Weekend Show. Uh, Juliet, there was a, a report out a couple of weeks ago from the Phoenix Police who apparently have a, a pattern of violating civil rights using excessive force. This is a, a Justice Department report that said police in Arizona City discriminate against black, Hispanic and Native American people. They found pervasive failings that have disguised and perpetuated problems for years. The problem, I, as I see it, is much of law enforcement are also, you know, white nationalists yeah. who are looking for a way to kind of, you know, play cowboys and yeah. use their guns lawfully. And then, of course, you have the unions protecting them and you, you get yourself into a whole other conversation about yeah. the fact that, you know, at what point do people go, OK, you know, who are the goodies and who yeah. are the baddies? Yeah. No, I, so, I, so there's so many issues to unearth it. To, to discuss. So the first is just this is now the remember I said public policy versus public policy issue. We have too many goddamn police departments in this country. Why does the Uvalde school district have a police department? Like what? What? what is, so part of it is we got to stop funding because they all get federal funding through the COPS program and various grants. Program. Stop funding so many goddamn police departments because it's not that. It's obviously it's not like, you know, Memphis police, big city departments have their problems. I get, I get that, but you cannot, uh, you cannot raise the floor in terms of our police, uh, um, in terms of policing, uh, one jurisdiction at a time. We need to, so one is just from the, from the, if I were queen, right. And I think about this all the time, you're like, you know, what, what Ferguson, what the heck? Like, wh why do we have tanks? Like, part of it is just like the the governance structures of these police departments make them insular because they are they are they are well armed, they're well paid, and they are they are in charge of their um of their area. So that's sort of one issue. It doesn't solve all the issues. The second is of you know is um is that uh and it's it's getting challenge at times, but not enough is that, uh, that, uh, and you're starting to see some police chiefs begin to address this, which is if you, you know, you're, you're, if you keep moving your bad seed, right, because the union's protecting them, he's eventually going to do something that the other police will not be able, will, it will impact the police department as a whole. So we've seen that. We've seen that time again. All of these guys have records. Almost none of them are like, oh, that's the first time. Just out of the blue, he did something, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's always a systemic. It's not a bad, you know, the systems can be bad, but often bad people take advantage of systems that are not, that are self-regulated. So you need a lot more oversight over these police departments, a lot more of Democratic mayors, it, it's on them for these larger police departments and often Democratic governors to step up. We have a case here in Massachusetts. I have my opinions about it. I think the defendant is guilty. She killed her uh, police uh, boyfriend. But there is stuff being exposed in the text and in the, in the case um, that show a sexism within the state police that's not being addressed by our female governor, female Democratic governor. So these are the kinds of things where this is, you know, th th this is going to, I'm not blaming Democrats, this is going to be, we need, Democrats need to stop letting police departments run their own shop. I mean, and you're starting to see police chiefs getting fired and stuff. As for the conservatism, okay, so I have a, I have a new, I have a, a new goal. You remember when all the progressives started running for DA and they were going to, you know, overturn? We need 90% of sheriffs. I, I want every young 
diverse lawyer in or, or police officer to run for sheriff. It's the, it's the, it's the sheriff's departments, which are elected, um, which, um, and have almost no political accountability where, um, a lot of this bad stuff is happening, including on the immigration front. Um, yes. and so I, I think well, they're, they're I, circumnavigating immigration authorities now. Right. Exactly. Too. They're so doing I'm it in so, Texas. Yeah, they're exactly. doing it so, in Florida. Right. So you're just thinking about what's my, you know, I think about this because I, you know, think about governance and, and who's in charge. This is a system that whatever benefit accrued out of it, which there was almost none. Um, I would, I would, I, I want to, I would, I would fund a campaign to, to, to begin to have, um, people run against each other, as we saw in the, in the, in the campaigns for AG DA, that that, that model doesn't work anymore. Um, but it's going it, to, these are elected officials. You got to get them out. Someone so, start that, someone start that campaign. It would, it would be, it would be very useful. I think maybe just putting women in all posts would be very helpful as well. I mean, because the guys have had their chance. I know a lot of women chance. in law enforcement who would be glad to. I should get them right. to run. Yeah. 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 And, and there's been some notable ones who have tried to run, like Val Demings, for example. Yeah. You know, yeah. With, with so much experience in, in law enforcement. Um, okay, finally, let's, let's just talk about, I want to quote, and I would never normally quote somebody like um, J.D. Vance, but he's a potential VP pick for Donald yeah. Trump. And, and he said that he was vetted on questions that would actually disqualify Donald Trump from being a VP, let alone a P, right? He, he said he was asked whether he committed a crime or had ever lied. Yeah. And, and this, you know, went viral online. I mean, this is the irony, just to kind of finish up, this is the irony, isn't it, that, that the Republicans are backing a convicted felon who I think has to surrender his firearm license if he has one donald trump um and you know couldn't get a job working in target let alone working in the white house it, it is this double standard we're hearing it from with the supreme court as well where you know there's no ethics and all, all of those things whereas lower judges are have to stick to a very tight code just talk to this idea yeah. of, a, of a double standard the kind of the the white elite yeah invariably men who seem to time and time again, just keep getting away with it. Yeah, that it is. I mean, it's, um, you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I live, I work in a world of entitled men. Um, you know, I, I teach at Harvard and I'm in, in I'm in, uh, in, in Homeland Security. So, um, uh, no, it is, it, it's exactly, um, the, the, challenge is this sense of privilege. I, I, I actually want to talk, you know, apply this to what I experienced um, over the last year being on the faculty at Harvard, um, which I don't talk about that much, but um, my, whatever you think about what was happening here, um, my institution was defined by privileged white men who had narratives about this institution, rampant anti-Semitism, whatever. I mean, your, my experience here was so different than that narrative or, or you know, or, or, Larry, or for a former president Larry, of, of the University, Larry Summers. And basically, and I think, institu you know, institutions have become afraid of defending their equity. And I just think like, and so like, think about DOJ, right? I mean, the, only in the last two weeks have they started to be like, you know, put out stuff that's saying, this is crazy. This is massive. Part of it is because they're going after the attorney general directly. Right. But I mean, why is it so hard for institutions to defend themselves? Right. They, they have equities, they have interests, they have people who are part of them. And I, and, and, and the white and the, and the white privilege that got played out at, uh, about universities and what they represented, um, what meanwhile, you know, all of these people are calling about their kids, right? To get in and stuff, you know, like, um, and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and government institutions and the pushback. There's this, there's this idea, there's still a legacy idea that somehow, you know, and the White House is getting better about it too, that somehow if we, if we just, you know, if we go high, if, if they go low, we go high. But, 
Like there's this, I, I, I sometimes worry that it sometimes means we go silent. And I yes. think part of going high is to say why the low is wrong, right? That that whatever you say about academic institutions or whatever you say about X, Y, or Z, right? And I I would I you know to sit here and to watch you know my institution which I've committed you know just to get defined by this privilege of which. These were the same people who were saying free speech every single day, except for if a Palestinian student said it, and then they're all up in arms. And I think that, I mean, I think that's, that's right, you know, with the, with the, the, the hypocrisy just needs to be called out. I mean, whether it's JD Vance or it's Bill Ackman or it's whoever, right? It is, there's a hypocrisy. You can, you can say it's okay to be, you know, hypocritical if it involves Israel or if it involves becoming vice president, but it does need to be called out. Yeah. And institutions to, to not, need to, not to defend silent. themselves. Yes. And I think also a greater understanding that political discourse is complex and there isn't always an answer. You know, no, no side is necessarily right or wrong. It's the, the point is to actually have some depth to the understanding and the debate yeah. rather than just take a position and not really know why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think, you know, I think that's, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's complicated, but it doesn't, it's not less complicated by outrage. I mean, that's my plea to people like you got, we've got, we've got, it's, it's late June. We've got how many weeks it's like, we can win, but we're not going to win through outrage. Right. I mean, that's not going to, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be that yeah. we assert yeah, a you know, action. Our and, narrative. What's our and, narrative? And voice. Right. Yeah. Okay. Juliet Kayem, thank you for joining Thank you so session. much. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Catch me on the five minute news YouTube channel and join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch. <laughs>